Outsource Controller Bootcamp, if you haven't been here yet, um, please introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know where you're from. Feel free to interact, ask questions, this, that, the other. Um, four questions for Peter and Charlotte. Um, please put them in the Q&A. It'll just be easier for them to handle at the end of their presentation. Um, so if you have any questions during what they're talking about, put them in the Q&A and there'll be a chance for answering those questions at the end of the session. Um, this is an educational event, so we just wanted to let people know that we've got a bi-weekly masterclass that we put on called Cashflow Advisory Live. It's a community meetup. It's a place for people to kind of just hang out, talk about things. We usually put on an educational session and then talk about how our peers are handling it after that. It's actually been pretty neat. If you want some of the YouTube videos on that, just let us know and we can send those your way. We also have two education courses, one do it yourself and one active coaching so that people will uh, can learn how to essentially build out cash flow advisory practices. Um, so with that all said, this is the last piece on, on our agenda, the last session. Um, and Peter will guide us through importance of AR management and solutions and the importance of them and leverage, leveraging technology and specifically Veeam and how it works. And I'll just say before I kind of pass things over to him, I am a Veeam user. It's a great piece of technology. So um, I'll let you take it from there. I'll stop sharing and there you go. All right, great. Well, thanks so much for the introduction. And um, more importantly, thanks for inviting us to, to be a part of this, uh, this bootcamp. Um, this is exciting for us. And uh, you know, we've been partners with Helm for, for a while now. And uh, it's been uh, a great partnership, a, a lot of um, overlap in what we do and, and the types of customers that we serve. And uh, so we're, we're thrilled to be a part of this. And uh, last, I, I wanna thank everyone for, uh, for joining us today. So I'm uh, excited to uh, talk you through accounts receivable from, from my perspective. Um, so with that in mind, uh, I might introduce myself and Veeam first. So let me share my screen. All right, there we go. So a little bit about myself. My name is Peter Stewart. I'm a senior sales manager um, overseeing channel partnerships at uh, Veeam. Veeam is an APAR software solution for small businesses. And so we look to help uh, small businesses who are traditionally underserved by, uh, by, by the, the banking sector, by a lot of the, the sort of FinTech space, um, we help them really optimize the way in which they handle their AP and AR processes, while at the same time eliminating a lot of the costs that come along with that, uh, both in terms of uh, fees and uh, licensing um, and, and other aspects of AP and AR processes that could be costly. So that's what we do at Veeam. Um, myself, personally, you know, I'm, I'm really dedicated to, to offering value-based solutions to our accounting and bookkeeping partners and, and more importantly to their clients. Uh, so we work with, with our partners to introduce Veeam as a solution to their clients and we architect um, processes that, uh, that allow Veeam to automate aspects of their workflow. Um, when it comes to workflows, that's, that's, my, uh, that's my preference. I'm a big fan of, of understanding how accountants, bookkeepers, business owners, how they uh, manage processes within the financial operations of, of their company. And I look to find solutions uh, as far as their workflow goes. Uh, I've always had a passion for technology. And so I've experienced uh, in the uh, physical, physical security and life safety industry before um, moving over to FinTech, um, where I've, I've been in for about five years now working with Veeam. And if there's a day where I'm not working, uh, I'll be out fishing, uh, either through the ice or on the water uh, or, or spending some time with my, uh, my four kids outdoors. All right, so what are we going to be looking at today? So um, we're going to be looking at very broadly um, what role you can have in terms of uh, supporting your clients and optimizing their AAR process. Um, I'm going to talk specifically about the, the challenges, um, as well as the, the solutions that we've identified at Veeam through our efforts to, to build technology solutions that help small businesses streamline their processes for AP and AR. Um, so to that end, uh, I can tell you that I've spoken with hundreds of small businesses about the, the pain points that they experience, 
around the management of their, their AR. And, and those pains are in many cases directly related to the business's cash flow management. And so um, that, that's an intersection that, that we're going to dig into here. Um, and with that perspective in mind, you know, I'm excited to be here today discussing AR and, and especially excited to be sharing my thoughts on how accountants and bookkeepers can really build deeper and more impactful relationships with their clients while supporting them um, in, in optimizing how they adapt their AR process to be aligned with, with their cash flow needs. All right, so why? Um, as I mentioned before, helping your clients improve their AR process assures that your firm uh, is delivering meaningful uh, and impactful um, uh, uh, services and um, uh, advice to help them really optimize um, their, their AR process. Uh, subsequently, it can allow you to introduce new revenue um, from new paid services, new client acquisition and referrals, uh, and, and reselling new technology solutions uh, that you hadn't traditionally worked with as part of your firm's tech stack. So traditional receivables, what, what do you want to look for when evaluating the present state of your client's receivables process? Um, I think if you were to dissect any small business, you'd find a wide range of, of, of tools, processes. In a lot of cases, those will be antiquated. Um, they might be broken or, or resource intensive. Uh, so let's look at how you can really begin to, to dissect their AR process and what you want to look to when you're trying to evaluate it. So first, you know, let's look at how they're approving customers for credit terms, right? So um, with, with, within any AR, you're providing uh, payment terms to customers, uh, allowing them some measure of credit um, from your business. And essentially, there's, there's no, I think, easier way for any business to get credit than to do so from a supplier. Um, and that's because most businesses do very little vetting of new customers. They're trying to balance risk and at the same time, balance that against the desire to treat new customers like gold. Uh, and that's particularly the case in, in crowded and competitive markets. Um, some customers or some clients may have proprietary processes um, where they collect information from customers that support some sort of basic credit review. So you may have seen this before where a new customer is onboarded and there's, there's some sort of form that's filled out. Um, providing basic information about their business to support perhaps a, a credit score review. Um, they may ask for references from, from other um, sellers, uh, can take a lot of different forms. Um, you also want to understand how they're managing credit approvals and limits, right? So if a customer is approved for a particular uh, credit limit that they can purchase against, does your client have the capacity to? track that and manage it such that they're able to adjust it, perhaps increasing that credit limit over time with good payers, uh, similarly reducing it or restricting it um, for, for bad payers, and, and do customers have visibility into uh, their credit limit? Um, now we'll look at invoicing processes as well. Um, it's important to look at whether uh, they have automated any, uh, some or all aspects of generating and issuing invoices. There are a lot of technology tools to support that. Um, but I'm sure as, as a lot of you have seen, um, many small businesses rely on um, fairly manual processes to generate um, and distribute their invoices. Um, so if it is manual, uh, if their process for creating those invoices for sharing them with customers is manual, you know, how flexible are their templates? Um, does it leave room for human error, which I think you'll find is, is, is often the case. Um, so it, whether it's in terms of, of how purchases um, are, are itemized and priced in the document, um, payment instructions, due dates, uh, there's a number of dynamic fields in an invoice that are going to change from each record to the next. Um, and so where you have a manual process, you're opening the door uh, to human error, right? And, and, and we'll see that in any sort of business function where 
uh, you know, a manual process is dealing with data points that need to be precise. Um, and so invoicing is no exception. And where you have a manual process, you're invariably going to have um, risk of human error, which can lead to deficiencies, delayed payment, inaccurate payment, uh, confusion, and you know, added communication that didn't need to take place between uh, the buyer and the seller. It's important to also consider who's creating and sending these invoices. Um, so within many businesses, uh, you'll see salespeople creating invoices for their customers. Um, you might see an office manager tasked specifically with this or, or the business owner themselves uh, may take care of it, or they might outsource it. Uh, they, they, they may push this towards their, their accountant, their bookkeeper, um, or, or even a third party um, and, and factor uh, their, their receivables. Um, through a, a, a third party that's essentially going to buy them or finance against them. Um, if multiple people are involved, uh, the necessity to, to automate becomes significantly more important, just both to mitigate the risk of errors um, or, or mismanagement, uh, but it's also going to free up valuable time. Uh, you know, across numerous business functions, depending on, on who's involved in that process. But again, where you have manual entry, you're invariably seeing people burning uh, time and other resources, preparing, evaluating, approving, correcting, um, and, and, and managing the, uh, the creation and distribution of, of invoices. Then last, there's, there's a collections process too, um, right? So, so I'm sure as all of you know, uh, with, within any AR process, um, there are going to be late um, and bad payers. Um, so, you know, there are myriad ways to deal with collections, uh, and I'm sure we're all familiar with them. We can, uh, we can sell off uh, all of our, our bad debt. Um, we can have outsourced third parties that uh, will, will support the collection process and we can do it internally. And that's what we see most, most small businesses doing is they like to take that on themselves in an effort to protect the customer relationship at the same time as obviously recovering the amount owed. Um, and that presents some problems where, um, you know, the value that the relationship with that customer presents can sometimes, uh, um, obscure uh, or uh, sort of muddy the waters when it comes to making an objective decision about how best to, to collect uh, and how much pressure you want to apply as far as the, the collections go. Um, further to that, for, for late payers, if they're consistently late, uh, you know, do, do you want to be resizing or restricting the, the credit limits or the terms? So what that could look like is, is a, a customer uh, may be late for payment and, and, and you may be required to restrict the amount uh, that they can order against on credit terms, um, or you can potentially restrict the term. Uh, so the credit terms in, in terms of maybe reducing uh, payment term from uh, net 30 down to net 50 or net 15. Uh, and in some cases, you may, you may want to transition the customer to, to payment on delivery. Uh, of goods, taking them off credit terms uh, and providing a path for them to sort of restore their good standing uh, in your credit model, or perhaps to leave them consistently uh, on a different uh, credit basis. Um, it's important to look at also uh, whether they have any sort of leverage to support their collection. And so in different industries, there can be different levers you can pull uh, to support the, the collection. And, and one, one example that stands out to me uh, and one that I find particularly interesting is, is the wine and spirits industry. Um, so in many states across the U.S., there are these archaic laws that, that govern payment terms when it comes to distributors of, of, of wine and, and spirits um, aimed at protecting their receivables. Um, so these are laws that were, were actually largely intended uh, to protect the interests of large distributors in the era, the era following uh, the end of prohibition. And, and I think uh, uh, we all know who, who the, uh, the big players were in that industry at the time, and they carried a lot of weight and a lot of power. Um, we're talking about the mafia, really. Um, and, and so they were able to lobby state governments, codify laws that, that protected their receivables, essentially requiring that uh, any sort of buyers, retailers, bars, restaurants um, that don't pay 
their bills on time, risk losing their liquor license altogether. Um, and so where you have, you know, a unique lever like that in a particular industry, you want to make sure that your customer is able to leverage that properly as part of their, their collections process. Um, you want to look at what is the overall cost of resources devoted to collections. That's something you should be able to quantify. And if you can't, then I don't think there's a very efficient process around it. Um, but uh, whether you're doing it internally, or as I mentioned before, outsourcing uh, or selling your collections uh, to third parties, you should have a clear understanding uh, objectively of, of what the, the cost uh, of that is to the business's bottom line. Uh, and then obviously, Evaluating that cost allows you to really understand where you can optimize the process to, to minimize it. Um, payment methods are important as well with, within any receivables process. And I think what you'll find is that your clients um, probably have not diversified a whole lot in this space. Um, but in, in terms of sort of evaluating the present state of their collections, um, you want to be looking at uh, you know, where the money should be going um, what sort of burden there is on the customer and, and any sort of costs associated with that. And so, like I said, as the landscape of payment methods for SMBs continues to, to expand um, quite rapidly, right? Um, a lot of small businesses have really failed to keep pace with the variety of payment options that are out there. And, and, and most importantly, with those that are going to be the most attractive and or familiar uh, with their customers. Um, you know, I think it's, it's a bit of a, um, an archaic outlook uh, that a lot of businesses have where they have a very rigid set of payment methods that they support. Um, but we're, we're moving towards a space now where the decisions or the choices made around payment methods that are available to customers uh, is a decision that's made with the customer's satisfaction in mind as sort of the focal point. Um, and so with that in mind, different industries, different types of goods, um, different types of sales may all necessitate different uh, combinations of payment methods, but an outlook on the customer, the payer's satisfaction and familiarity with a, a particular payment method should be a major focus in determining uh, what you offer. Um, not just strictly um, something that's most convenient to you as a receiver, most cost-free um, to you as a receiver, there's a balance that should be struck there. And a lot of small business owners aren't really necessarily in tune with that. And so it's not, there's an opportunity there to really advise and open their eyes to um, the, the, the wealth of, of payment solutions that are out there that can be uh, presented to customers when you're invoicing them. Right now, I think if you were to look at, uh, you know, 100 invoices generated by your, your clients, you'd probably find about 90 to 95 percent of them contain very basic payment instructions that uh, lists their bank account and says, hey, send an ACH payment to this bank account, or here's our address if you want to pay by check. Um, there's very little in the way of, of technology, and there's very little in the way of optionality for, uh, for customers. So. We can see where AR becomes a major variable that affects a business's cash flow. Um, so how can a business better mitigate risk in this context and, and to help bridge cash flow gaps? Um, we'll look, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Right now we're looking at just the state of small business in the US. So um, just some basic uh, statistics here that help you understand the consequence of um, you know, AR that's mismanaged. We see 1.5% of receivables being written off as bad debt. 93% of businesses experiencing frequent um, late payment from customers. And, and, and I mean, I, I think uh, you'd see that with almost all of your clients that have um, uh, receivables um, on terms. 47% uh, of credit sales are paid late. Uh, and so this, this shows there's a trend uh, that can be observed and it's pretty obvious where, where buyers are often overextending their, their, uh, their suppliers. Um, and, and in many cases deliberately as a means to balance their own cash flow using their supplier as a bank. Um, average payment terms vary, um, but there's a delta 
between sort of the, the average payment terms and the average payment date. And again, that's where the greatest risk to cash flow management presents itself uh, because there's variability there that's unpredictable. Um, and so wherever you can find the right levers to pull and the right mechanisms to rein in that late payment and provide greater control and certainty around uh, getting paid on time, then you're delivering a lot of value, not just in terms of a streamlined process, but in terms of cash flow management as well. But um, what can small businesses do uh, to help manage this, this unpredictable cash flow gap? One of, the, one of the, the sort of stopgap solutions that you'll find more and more businesses turning to is, is lending, and particularly short-term lending uh, as a means to, to bridge that gap. Oops. Um, in their uh, in their AR process, and you know we we see a lot of that within Veeam. Um, we have clients that uh, you know have moved away from the traditional outlook on lending, uh, particularly short term lending, towards one that uh, that embraces it as a way to shore up um, cash flow when there is uh, you know a heavy accounts receivable burden. Um, there are a wealth of technology solutions out there to support this as, as well. Um, but uh, lending can often be a big part of the solution. Um, but at the same time, uh, SMBs often spend a considerable amount of time uh, and, and resources as well, trying to navigate uh, lending systems. And so I mentioned, you know, there are technology tools, there are other products that are being introduced with the aim of making it easier for small businesses to access working capital. Um, but when it comes to sort of the traditional um, means of, of, of acquiring um, uh, new capital, main, mainly through, through traditional lenders like banks, you know, the process is, is difficult for small businesses and the cards are stacked against them. Uh, so as, as I'm sure you know, many small businesses don't have the type of credit history that's going to uh, make them attractive uh, to many lenders. Um, they're forced to go through what are pretty cumbersome uh, bureaucratic processes uh, to put their applications in front of decision makers uh, to get them reviewed and approved. Um, a lot of uh, financial documentation is required and that puts a burden on businesses that might not necessarily always um, have, uh, you know, pristine books uh, and, and, and pristine records. Um, and, and there's a, a focus on very rigid um, indicators when evaluating uh, businesses for, for credit. And those, again, aren't, aren't often favorable to small businesses. And it's these traditional lenders that uh, uh, have been very reluctant to embrace technology as well as you know, alternative data inputs to support uh, new models of, of evaluating businesses for credit. And that's where some fintechs have stepped in and provided some products that help small businesses make you know, brief or sometimes instant uh, credit applications with, with, with instant uh, uh, approval decisions, as well as other credit instruments that can sit between a seller and a buyer um, when it comes to receivables. Um, you'll see some instances of businesses resorting, as I mentioned before, to factoring. Uh, so that might be a model where they uh, will sell their receivables to, to essentially bridge that gap. It doesn't quite qualify as financing um, because there, there isn't necessarily a lending taking place, but uh, rather it's, it's a means of, of taking open receivables uh, and, and outsourcing or selling uh, that receivable as an asset um, to a third party, a factor, who's going to buy them at a discounted rate and then transfer the burden of collection onto themselves. Uh, and, and that also carries a, a, um, a transfer of the customer relationship to a certain extent. Um, but again, it can be a, a, a tool that uh, a business can rely on where they may not necessarily qualify for credit elsewhere. Um, let's look at uh, how communication factors into AR now. Um, so, you know, part of the issue with collections comes down to accountability. Uh, so, so most, most methods of payments and, and collections, uh, you know, don't have proper processes uh, to enable uh, or to streamline uh, communication between the, the customer and the vendor. 
especially as it relates to a particular invoice uh, or, or open credit that's uh, that's owed. And, uh, and these gaps are easy for, for buyers, like I said before, to overextend their supplier. Um, and, and, and again, it can be a scenario where, where you see businesses, you know, using their supplier essentially as a bank. So they're able to shore up their own cash flow by, by, you know, pushing back payment. And so, you know, we've, we've all heard this story, um, you know, or the groans from, uh, you know, small business owners that deal with, um, the old adage, you know, the check is in the mail and, you know, the United States is very reliant on check payments still. Uh, that's something that uh, companies like Beam are working hard to um, to help uh, businesses move away from. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's a classic pain point where, you know, you as a seller are relying on your customer uh, to not only ensure that a check arrives on the stated due date, um, but to to ensure that you have the confidence that it's on route. Um, that it's been sent. Uh, and so you can find no shortage of folks in AR that deal with this with uh, particular customers that pay by check and, uh, you know, will routinely, uh, you know, tell you stories about the check being lost in the mail and, and blaming the poor postal service for uh, their inability to get uh, a payment made on time uh, or a check delivered on time. Um, so, you know, I, I'm sure we've all heard that story. Um, you know, I've, I've spoken to accountants as well and bookkeepers who have uh, experienced the same issues with, with their clients. And so, you know, without proper ways to verify a transaction, I, you, know, you know, a notification, for example, that a, a payment is, is on route guaranteed to have been sent, um, customers can, again, exploit this flexibility. And so that hurts the bottom line at the end of the day of any business. Um, and it's going to create, again, constraints on cash flow. Um, where there is a high level of, of unpredictability uh, and you're not able to forecast um, and collect on uh, the payment due date. So another thing to consider is the cost. Um, there is going to be a cost associated with uh, any accounts receivable process. You're going to have costs related to any type of software um, that you're using, um, or at least with, with, with many types. Um, but you're also going to have transactional costs on payments. And that's something that we at Beam have a lot of expertise in because we live and breathe uh, payments. Um, so what we'll see is, uh, you know, you can expect with, within, any, um, within any AR process that's selling into foreign markets, you're going to be dealing with foreign exchange. Um, so your clients may be selling into an overseas market and the variability of foreign exchange rates coupled with you know, the commissions that are baked into a, a bank's foreign exchange rate, excuse me, this means that the amount that you collect from a customer may vary um, from the expected payment amount uh, at the time of invoice, right? So, you know, we can, we can go on Google today and we can search the, the US dollar and Canadian exchange rate. Um, and I, if, if I go and check that rate a week from now, that's going to change. Um, so you need to be able to balance um, those uh, that rate variability as part of the AR process. Um, and at the same time, you want to manage those costs. So when it comes to foreign exchange, the cost that you can manage um, is the, the commission. Um, so you want to be savvy about uh, the commission being taken out of any foreign exchange transaction by your bank or any third party. Uh, you know, Veeam, just like any other uh, service that does foreign exchange, we do have that commission. We're, we're transparent about it. And, you know, you hope that other services, other institutions are equally as transparent about what that um, commission looks like and what that rate looks like uh, on any given um, exchange. But that's not always the case. So it's important to understand what that cost is so that you can uh, account for that in terms of uh, evaluating the, the costs of your, your AR process. There are going to be other fees related to, to payments. So if, again, in the context of international payments, you'll see uh, landing fees often. Certain banks, particularly in Canada, uh, will impose uh, landing fees on wires that are, are settled from uh, overseas payers. Um, you'll have intermediary fees where funds are deducted uh, by intermediary banks that are supporting the, uh, the transmission of funds. Um, and depending on, on whether they're collecting payment by credit card or, or some other payment methods that, you know, there may be merchant fees uh, associated with, with the processing of funds as well. 
And so all of this needs to be accounted for when you're establishing the, the, the cost of, uh, of, of a particular AR process. Um, and similarly, you know, you should be prepared to advise on how uh, your client can best mitigate or minimize um, these fees and, and manage them um, so that, uh, you know, they, they're able to build that into the overall um, uh, management of their AR process. All right, so it's important to understand how best to advise on payment methods as well. You know, we touched on this earlier in that you know, a lot of businesses aren't necessarily um, aware of the best payment options uh, that they should be offering. And they're also not necessarily aware of what would be what makes for an attractive payment method um, to their customers. And, and to this point, optionality is key. Um, but there can still be some limiting factors. Um, you should ask the following questions. First, you know, what options should we provide customers? And should we accept payments sent by other means? Um, so again, there, as I mentioned before, there are limiting factors. So there may be certain payment methods that are, are too costly. Um, so a lot of small businesses won't take credit card uh, because of the merchant fees um, or, or maybe also risk of chargeback or a combination of those two factors. But um, there might also be certain payment methods that don't support large payment volumes or payment amounts uh, that are more restrictive to uh, or more centered around sort of small purchases or, or person to, like peer to peer payments, uh, as opposed to being focused on B2B payments and supporting large volumes uh, at any given time. Um, you want to also ask, is it optimal for the business? Um, so there are buy now, pay later options, which may be really attractive um, to customers. Um, but if there's any sort of fee on the seller, you know, is that too much of a burden for the margins uh, to be supported? Or is that risk pushed back from the, uh, uh, the buy now, pay later service onto the seller such that they're liable for, for bad customer payments? Um, you should also find out Again, what payment methods are attractive to the types of customers you're looking to attract? And so depending on the industry, depending on the sort of segment of customers that you're chasing, you may be able to find out um, what payment methods are commonly supported by competitors. Uh, you may be able to uh, ask your customers themselves, you know, what, uh, what payment methods are you looking for? Or you may find that uh, you, you, you send out an invoice with your preferred payment methods listed on it and you find a, a customer paying you by some other means and you may say, okay, well, we should adapt that or we should adapt to this and introduce this new payment method into, uh, in, into the um, various methods that, that we, uh, we propose or that we, uh, that we support as listed on our invoice. Um, and so at Veeam, you know, we see that a lot. We see uh, a, a business that's been invoiced with more traditional payment uh, instructions, you know, send an ACH to this bank account here or send a check to this address. Um, but then they'll bring that invoice to Veeam, they'll load it into our, our, our platform um, and send the bank payment out through Veeam. And the recipient will accept the payment, uh, they'll onboard. Generally, it's very seamless, a positive experience with no fees. And then we often see those very same sellers begin to host their invoices and share their invoices through Veeam and invite their customers to, uh, to, to pay through Veeam in addition to uh, the various other payment methods that they support. So what, what do you want out of an AR process? And I mean this in the context of, of, of a business owner. Um, you know, we've covered a lot of the challenges presented to many small businesses when it comes to their AR process. And we've talked about the aspects of the process that require pretty careful consideration. Um, and so if we bring these considerations together, we're left with really four key elements to a healthy AR system that should be the focal point of, of small businesses. So if you want to, you know, come into a discussion with a client where you're evaluating their AR process, this should be the sort of checklist uh, of items that you're looking for, for a healthy AR process. And, and, and where they're lacking, these are, these are I, I think, the key objectives that you want to work towards uh, in terms of adjusting um, your client's process. So automation and digitate, di digitization with, with technology solutions is, is 
critical. And, and so there are a lot of ways you can go about this. And obviously automation, digitization are big, broad, far reaching words. And so there are um, tools and processes that you can, that help you automate very granular aspects of your AR process, you know, simple notifi reminder notifications to um, your, your, your client's customers um, can be as simple as, as configuring uh, a workflow through uh, through through Gmail even um, to trigger those uh, those automations, or it can be more robust and complex. Uh, so at Veeam, for example, um, we take uh, invoices generated from any external third party, host them within Veeam, and distribute the invoices, providing whatever payment methods you want to attach to it, be it you know card, check, ACH, um, wire, virtual wallet, you name it. Um, there are uh, invoicing tools that will integrate with uh, inventory as well as you know, sales platforms to automate the full process of creating the invoice, distributing it, updating your inventory records, um, and then ultimately marking the, uh, the invoice as paid when, when the payment comes through. But um, anywhere along that sort of spectrum of automation and digitization where you can sort of move the needle further towards uh, a greater level of automation, um, you're doing good work to support that client and, and really streamlining their process. So it should be um, a, a goal of yours to advise your clients on, on how they can really bring more automation into that process. Um, not only is it going to streamline the process and, and sort of reduce the resources and costs that go along with it, but, but it also eliminates a lot of room for, for human error. Um, so whether that's uh, the you know itemization, as I mentioned before, where, where you can see errors in terms of, of how items are, are notated and priced within an invoice, uh, or even more simple things about uh, you know putting in uh, your bank information for uh, for, for payment, um, there is a wealth of opportunity for human error given all the many variables that go into an invoice, right? You know, it's uh, uh, in addition to the itemization, the bank information, you have due dates, you have names, addresses, customer numbers, invoice IDs, all of that, um, which if left to a manual process invariably is going to lead to, to error. So automation is not only going to streamline your process and, and make the, the machine of your AR system work better, but it's going to uh, eliminate that risk that comes from all the myriad ways in which human error can factor into it uh, negatively. Um, you want to make sure there's that support for a diversity of payment methods. Uh, you know, the key ones that I think most businesses should expect should be expected to offer uh, are, are bank payments, um, which can be supported just by providing bank information, like I said, and, and instructing customers to pay uh, through their, their, their bank, either, you know, an ACH payment or if they're international, a, a wire payment. But it can also be supported through technology products. And, and so Veeam is one of those, but there are many others out there like Veeam. Uh, that allow a business to use software uh, to originate and track bank payments. Um, and so, you know, Veeam, again, fits into that equation. And if you were to um, look at all the solutions that are out there, you'd find a plethora that, that can support this in different ways for different types of businesses. Um, digital payments can be supported in a number of ways. You know, we're all familiar with PayPal and seeing um, uh, PayPal listed as an option on invoices. Um, there are other types of virtual wallets um, that can uh, that can support um, uh, sort of virtual payment. Um, card payment is is an important one, uh, as I mentioned before, and I'm sure as all of you know, uh, a lot of small businesses are reluctant um, to offer card payment. Uh, carries obviously a hefty merchant fee, usually around three uh, percent, but also the risk of chargebacks, which, um, you know, if you've ever navigated that process of, of challenging a chargeback, it's very much in favor of the, the buyer, uh, puts a huge burden on, um, on, on the seller. Uh, so that's, that's something, you know, we've observed in terms of trying to understand how it being we can help small businesses improve their AR process. And so the solution we found is one that, again, you'll find other, other solutions in the market that, that, uh, that offer a similar model, but it's one that um, allows payers to pay by credit card uh, while the settlement is, is made by bank payment. So it eliminates the fee and transfers the fee to the payer, uh, but also means that you don't need to set up a merchant account with, with some card processor. Veeam does that, 
takes on that risk of chargeback and the payment completes um, by regular bank transfers. So there are ways around some of the challenges, uh, some of the risks and concerns that folks will often have with, with card payment. Um, then there, there are pay later products. So we're all familiar, I think, with, with a lot of the consumer uh, pay later products that, uh, that you'll see on a lot of e-commerce checkouts. Um, it's an attractive payment method. You know, as, a, as a consumer, I, I love the idea of being able to break out a large pur purchase into installments um, at a relatively low cost, if, if there's a cost at all. But uh, as a seller, uh, this can be an attractive tool as well. Uh, often they carry costs um, to, the, to the seller to essentially allow their customers to, to finance a purchase. But uh, even in the B2B space, there are similar products that can be valuable in terms of attracting new customers that may not necessarily be able to pay cash for the full purchase value. Um, it might allow for the ability um, to get larger purchases or larger orders from particular customers who otherwise, you know, again, may not have the, the cash flow available to sustain a large purchase, but with the ability to break that into installments, they're able to make a larger order or maybe even more frequent orders um, as they sort of structure their own cash flow management around the installment payments that come with a sort of pay later um, product that, that's available. And, and these services can be tied to your, your, your client's invoicing. Um, so, you know, uh, in, in many cases, the customer can apply for approval through a link in an invoice, um, and, and all of that can be automated. Um, so it can become a, a, a pretty valuable part of your AR process um, that, that eliminates a lot of the, the pain points that we've been highlighting around late payment and frequent payment uh, uh, risk. And, um, but obviously, that's, that's, that needs to be balanced in terms of uh, how willing your client is to uh, absorb those fees or, or perhaps transfer some of that, that, the burden of those fees onto the, uh, the buyers. Um, there should be some measure of automation um, when it comes to um, reconciling payments from customers with an open invoice in whatever technology you're using to, um, to manage your AR. Um, so this is something Veeam does, and it's something that you should expect from, from other payment methods, especially digital payment methods that you bring on board. They should be able to integrate with your accounting suite. Uh, and when a payment is made on an invoice, that, that invoice should be automatically marked as paid. Um, some services like Veeam may, may go a step further uh, and provide a, a measure of payment tracking so that as a payment is created, that's reflected on the invoice and you are notified. Um, and then on the invoice, uh, the estimated completion date can be listed uh, to give you that added visibility. But the key piece there is, is the automation that, that marks that invoice is paid to avoid a lot of the inefficiencies um, and, and the resource burden that's going to come with uh, having to track and, and reconcile that manually. Bonus points as well, if the service is able to help the customer, the buyer, automate their pay. Um, so you can uh, find solutions that will allow your customers to automate, uh, let's say, a recurring payment if they have a consistent receivable or a consistent payable uh, to be made to your client's business, uh, or, or, or perhaps one where they can schedule a payment to be automatically pulled from them on the payment or on the invoice's due date. Um, but where you can introduce uh, that type of optionality to customers that's going to allow them to automate their process, that's, that's perfect. All right, so again, what are some of the tools that are out there? There's a plethora I'm showing you, you know, a, a dozen or so here, you can probably find a hundred. Um, but what you'll see is there's, there's a, a cross section of different types of players um, that are offering different types of solutions to different types of customers. So you see small uh, fintechs here, you see the large, more established uh, fintechs like, like PayPal. Um, you'll see uh, big banks as well, wading into this space, all trying to find different ways that they can introduce technology to solve problems for businesses that are gonna help them either retain their existing customers, like in the case of banks, or in the case of Veeam, other more recent fintechs to track new customers and, 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 and build a network of, of, of small businesses around a new technology solution. Um, so when it comes to invoicing, you know, what are the, the various methods that are available to you uh, in terms of sharing your, your invoices and getting paid from them, right? So, I mean, there's traditional in, invoicing where you can have tools that are going to generate your invoice for you. I'm sure you've seen plenty of these, QBO being one that I'm sure you're all familiar with. 
um, but there are many others. Um, Armatic is, is one that I love. Uh, it's a great tool. Um, but uh, you'll, you'll also find many ERPs and, and other systems have caked within them their own proprietary invoicing software. Um, you may find pay links. This is something Veeam supports. And so, um, you know, you can take an invoice that's, uh, that's, that's built anywhere um, and you can add a Veeam pay link to it. So it's going to sort of add a layer of digitization or automation to, um, to an invoice uh, that's generated through some other process. Um, or you can have a, a payment request service. And so this, again, is something Beam supports. Uh, you'll find uh, many other payments and, and, and AR systems support this as well, where a particular payment service or other software will host uh, an invoice. So you can create your own invoices wherever you want, but you send, distribute those invoices through a, a technology product. Uh, that's going to deliver that invoice to clients um, or to customers and to give them a, a smooth process to pay that, uh, in most cases, electronically. Uh, Peter, I'm uh, just going to give you a timing warning. Um, okay. We have enough time for Q&A. So Great. We've got like five, five-ish minutes. All right. We're, we're right at the end anyway, so that's perfect. We'll open up the awesome. Q&A in a second. Um, in terms of, of payment methods of, that, that we support, these, these are ones that you should find. Um, most other payment services uh, that you're working with should also support, and that's bank payment, some type of virtual wallet, uh, and card payment. And again, there are different models for card payment. Um, there are some that, like I said, will allow the, uh, the payer to incur the fees, others the payee, um, but uh, you should have some facility to, uh, to accept those. Uh, payment tracking is a key benefit as well, um, and so you should be looking for a solution that's going to provide some measure of tracking. That's something we do with Veeam, something we take very seriously, and something that provides a lot of value to our users. So when your invoice is, is claimed and a payment is created, you get notified, you know that payment is on route, you know when the payment's going to complete. You don't have to go chasing your customer, um, and so any service that can provide some sort of notification and tracking um, is going to be really valuable. Um, so again, with Veeam, uh, you know, collecting payments should be easy. That's what we do. Uh, we uh, allow our users to, like I said before, share their invoices through Veeam, have them hosted by Veeam, introduce Veeam as the payment method. We have the pay link that can be added uh, to any invoice, any file, anywhere you want. Your customers click it. It brings you to a page where they can pay you. Um, and we provide a, a whole range of uh, visibility tools that allow any organization from one person to a hundred to be able to manage um, AR processes of any complexity with, with minimal fees. But um, I'm going to cruise through the uh, end of this to allow enough time for a Q&A. Um, so I want to thank you again for, for joining us today. I would love to uh, uh, open up the floor to any questions. Uh, my colleague Charlotte, uh, who oversees our marketing here at Veeam, has been uh, keeping track of any questions from the chat. So Charlotte, uh, if there are any, I'd like to know. Yeah, um, so I'll start it off here, but please continue typing it in if you guys have any additional questions. Um, Mark is asking if you can elaborate on how you can pass the credit card fee onto the client and how that works. Yeah, yeah. So essentially, there, there, there's a model in which a third party payment service like Veeam um, can essentially function as the merchant of record on a payment, such that, you know, if, if let's say you invoice a, a, a client uh, through Veeam and they select credit card as their preferred funding method, we're going to be the merchant of record. So uh, we're going to be processing the credit card payment. And then within our product, we give um, our users the option. Uh, so if they're invoicing through Veeam, they can say, hey, I want to incur that fee, that Veeam's fee is 3%. So I want to incur that fee um, or I want to pass that on to my customer. So the customer, when they're making that card payment, will be shown a, um, a screen that tells them, hey, you know, you're paying this amount from your card. Um, you'll be incurring this fee. And it's a great way for small businesses that are, again, are reluctant to offer card payment to do so in a way that transfers that cost to their customers. So they can very openly say, hey, if you do want to pay by card, I have a payment method. This is what the cost is going to be to you. Here's how you go about doing so. And so that's, that, that's how Veeam operates, but you'll find other uh, payment services that, that similarly uh, support uh, card payments under a similar model. So a follow-up question to that. Um, so how, does that migate, migate uh, chargeback risks? And 
are you allowed to pass that on to a client in Canada? So, so right now we don't do card payments in Canada. Uh, so, so Veeam is, uh, is doing card payments in the United States. Uh, we do a lot of vetting um, of businesses through automated security tools as they're coming in. And so that allows us to really mitigate a lot of uh, risks. Um, I, 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 I'll admittedly tell you, I don't know all the ins and outs of our chargeback policy, but generally it's uh, assumed by Veeam as the merchant of record. Um, but we do look to uh, the recipient to uh, to help support us in the effort to collect uh, funds from a, or, or to challenge a chargeback, um, if that's the case. Awesome. Was there any additional questions about the credit card fee or any other questions you guys want to ask? Well, we got Peter here. All right. I think we're good. I think we're good. All right. Well, with that in mind, um, we'll uh, we'll wrap up our piece here. But again, want to thank the great folks um, at Helm for inviting us to take part in this. Uh, it's exciting for us anytime we get to team up with uh, with one of our partners, and uh, love to see the uh, the enthusiasm around this event too. Uh, so it's great to see uh, so many people come together around such a great business. So um, thanks very much for having us. Thanks for attending. Um, it's been my pleasure. Uh, if you have any interest in learning more about Veeam, please don't hesitate to reach out. My email address is peter at veeam.com. So pretty straightforward. Uh, but we look forward to hearing from any of you. If you have some questions, we'd like to learn more. But uh, I want to thank you again for uh, taking some time to join us today. Yeah, thanks so much, Peter. It's been great having you and, and all the other hosts today. It's hopefully been a lot of good learning for all of the attendees. Um, I'll just share my end screen here. That's the end of the boot camp today. You know, it's been a it's been a four hours that have actually flown by pretty good, at least in my opinion. Um, lots of great talk, content. So thanks everybody for attending. Um, we really hope you found these sessions extremely valuable. And if you have any questions about any of the content, whether it's Beam, Peter, and Charlotte, or Kelly Parks, or Mark Wickersham, or ourselves here at Helm, please reach out to us, and we can give you any information that you need or point you in the right direction. So. Thank you everybody for attending and we'll call that the end. <laughs>